In R2, all lines that pass to the origin are going to be one-dimensional subspaces. We'll worry about the, what exactly one-dimensional means later on. We have a geometric intuition right now. So, for example, if you take any line through the origin, right, that's what forms the one-dimensional subspaces of R2. So you get something like this, this green and yellow line. Uh, these are examples of these one-dimensional subspaces. The x-axis, the y-axis themselves, and it doesn't really matter what angle you choose. As long as it passes through the origin, that's all that's going to matter to form a, a subspace, a one-dimensional subspace of, of R2. I should mention, of course, that the origin itself does form a subspace. It would be what we call zero-dimensional. It's just a point. And, of course, the whole the whole plane also forms a subspace, somewhat improper because you don't, you don't, it's everything, but every sub, every vector space is a subspace of itself, technically speaking, the way we've defined it. And so these would be all of the subspaces of R2. You have R2, you have the zero space, and you have all these lines that pass to the origin. That's going to be it. One could show that. Now, how does, how does one actually argue that if you have some other subset, uh, that why, why can't it be? Why can't it be a subspace? Well, remember, to be a subspace, you have to contain the zero vector, you have to be closed under addition, and you have to be closed under scalars. And so if you took an arbitrary affine set, if it passes through the origin, then it contains the origin. And like we mentioned here, those would be examples of subspaces. If your affine set doesn't pass through the origin, then automatically it's ruled out. So when it comes to subspaces versus affine sets, a flat is a subspace if and only if it contains the zero vector. We'll talk some more about that maybe a little bit later. But what about some other type of set? So take, for example, the set W. Uh, w is going to be the set of all vectors in the plane uh, whose x and y coordinates are non-negative. So let me actually scooch up the picture a little bit more right here, right? So we have our x and y plane. And so we're talking about these points right here. So we want points which are greater, its x coordinates greater than equal to zero and its y coordinates greater than equal to zero. We're talking about the first quadrant, sometimes called Q1, right? Uh, if you think of the plane Q2, Q3, Q4, right? Its usual orientation. We're talking about Q1. That's what this set W is talking about right here, this first quadrant. It, it, is it a subspace? I claim the answer is gonna be no. Now, why is it not a subspace, right? What's what's What stops us here? Now, we have to be very careful we, we look at this correctly. Now, does Q1, the, the, the first quadrant, does it contain the zero vector? And the answer is going to be yes, right? If you take the vector 0, 0, notice by definition here, the x coordinate has to be non-negative. Zero is okay. And the y coordinate, likewise, has to be non-negative. So if you take 0 and 0 as your x and y coordinates, these inequalities are satisfied. So it does pass the first test, right? We have these three conditions. Uh, the 0 vector needs to be contained inside of W. We get that. What about the second condition? The second condition says if you have vectors U and V, which live inside of W, then the sum of the vectors U plus V must also be inside of W. And so if we try to think of that just like an arbitrary example, we might have a point right here. We'll call this one u. And we take some other point, maybe call it v. Something like this. By the parallelogram rule, to form the sum, we would take copies of u and v, like we see right here. And then the sum of the vectors would be the diagonal of this, you're gonna get u plus v right here. And sure enough, that point does live inside of Q1, right? Uh, and, and so does that happen in general, right? So if you have vectors u and v, so you have like u equals say u1, uh, u2, and then v equals v1, v2. When you add these things together, algebraically speaking, you're gonna end up with u1 plus v1 comma u2 plus v2 and are these are these coordinates going to be non-negative numbers so think about the x coordinates because the x coordinates are non-negative u1 and v1 are numbers that are greater than or equal to zero when you add non-negatives together you're going to get something that's non-negative so u1 plus v1 is going to be greater than or equal to zero in this situation still right what about the y coordinate if we focus on this for a second, well, the same, same arguments in play right here. If y1 is greater than equal to zero, that means 
sorry, if y is greater than equal to zero, that means u2 has to be greater than equal to zero, v2 has to be equal to, greater than equal to zero. If you take these two positives, or maybe they're zero, right, you add them together, you're gonna get something that's greater than equal to zero still. And so it does turn out that when you focus on axiom two here for a subspace, it passes that condition. The sum of two vectors inside the first quadrant will be a vector in the first quadrant. So, so far we've showed that it has condition one, it has condition two, but I still claim it's not a subspace. So what has to fail, the thing that has to fail is gonna have to be the third condition. Uh, so let's, assuming my claim's even correct, right? So let me kind of erase what's on the screen a little bit. Imagine you have your vector, say V is this friend over here. Now, if we scale V by any positive number, that's just gonna elongate V some more, right? So we just make V get longer if it's bigger than one. Uh, maybe if it's smaller than one, it gets a little bit shorter like this. If it's equal to zero itself, that'll just give you the zero vector. All of those vectors are inside of V, inside of the Q1, aren't they? Well, the thing is it has to be true for any scalar. In particular, if you take the scalar negative one, you're gonna get negative V over here. And notice that negative V is actually living in Q3. That's not in Q1. It's not in the third quadrant anymore. And so this is where the violation happens that for this for this set of vectors, it is it does contain the zero vector, it is closed under addition, but it doesn't satisfy the scalar property, closed under scalars. So if U uh, belongs to W, then does CU belong to W? And in this situation, we get a big X. Eh, eh. It doesn't belong to the set and therefore it is not a subspace. To be a subspace, all three conditions have to be checked. Now to show that something's not a subspace, in fact, we could have skipped steps one and two and jumped straight to here, be like, oh, here's a counterexample. And we should be very explicit about our counterexample. Say V is the vector one, one. Notice that belongs to W. Let's take the scalar negative one, which is a real number. But on the other hand, if you take negative one, one, that is equal to negative one, negative one, which does not belong to W. And so because of this counterexample right here, we see that condition three fails. It fails, and then we would then conclude that W is not a subspace. So not every subset of a vector space is automatically a subspace. It has to be a subset that itself resembles a vector space. And to do that, we have these three algebraic uh, conditions. This is our litmus test when it comes to a subspace. It must contain the zero vector. It must be closed under addition. It must be closed under scalars. If any one of those three conditions is fa fails, then we do not have a subspace like we saw in this counterexample.